uh, Skype talk will go just as well in about an hour's time. Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking you all for coming um, and welcome you all to uh, this event. So I'll just say a bit about what this event is. Um, this is the Birmingham launch of an organisation called Giving What We Can. Um, Giving What We Can uh, is an organisation that was founded in 2009 uh, by a guy called Toby Ord. Today, Giving What We Can has 10 chapters, or as of today it has 10 chapters, because this is the 10th, uh, in four countries uh, across three continents. Um, so I'm just going to talk for about 10 minutes uh, before I hand over to the first speaker. I'm sure you're all desperate to, uh, to hear the people speak who actually came to see, so I won't take, you too long, uh, won't take too much of your time. Um, but I just want to say a little bit about what Giving What We Can is, as the reason that, I've invited, that we've invited the speakers here to talk today um, is to, uh, to kind of promote Giving What We Can Birmingham uh, and to launch our new chapter. So, for those of you that don't know what Giving What We Can does, um, I'd just like to sort of talk about the, the aims of the organisation. Giving What We Can has three aims broadly. Uh, the first one is to get more people to give, uh, the second is to get people to give more, and the third is to get people to give more effectively. So again, I won't take too much of your time, but I just want to sort of talk about what, what I mean by these three things. So getting more people to give uh, might be quite self-explanatory. Um, first idea is kind of spreading the word uh, about giving what we can and what we do. We're trying to create local communities, and we're hoping that giving what we can Birmingham will be one of these. Um, in terms of giving money to charity, uh, we're talking about setting examples. Um, so giving what we can is about uh, the, the best ways of affecting uh, poverty relief uh, and, and that kind of charity. So we think, perhaps contrary to popular belief, and, and maybe this is a bit controversial, that uh, it's really good to make as much noise as possible about these things. So there's this idea that giving to charity has to be kind of uh, secretive or personal or, or something like that. Um, but we think that you can be loud about it while still remaining humble about it. Um, and that's related to this fourth idea, which is very important to what Giving What We Can is, which is the pledge. Uh, and this is very much the core of, of what Giving What We Can is about. So members of Giving What We Can pledge to give away at least 10% of their income to what they think is the best way of combating poverty. So on the Giving What We Can website, um, there's a list of members. Um, so you can see the bottom of the list there. And what we're really hoping to do, one of the things we're hoping to do is add as many names as possible to this list. Now, the pledge is something that kind of scares a lot of people, and it's this kind of point in the talk where people's jaws drop and they think, 10% of my income for the rest of my life, I can never do that. Um, we're not sort of, we're not going to browbeat people into signing this pledge today, that's not what we're here to do. Um, but we, well, we, I mean, we'd like to do that ideally, but there are other ways that you can help as well that aren't uh, to do with the pledge. Uh, and things like that are helping with events like this, um, spreading the word through blogs and talks and things, um, becoming part of the, the local community. Um, giving What We Can does a lot of cost effectiveness research, so part of what we do is to look at different charities uh, and recommend them. Um, so it, it, it's about looking at charities and, and looking at what the most uh, cost effective ones are, uh, and then publishing uh, a list of these which you can see on the website. Um, which just is, is kind of our recommendations about which charities um, people, uh, which charities are the most cost effective. We do other types of research as well, but I won't go into that. Um, and another thing that we do is, is kind of we're very sort of philosophical, so we have lots of discussions and debates about giving and, and the kind of ethical aspects of that. Uh, and that's one of the things that we like to get going in Birmingham as well. Okay, so going back to the, the aims, that, that's kind of the first one. Um, the second two, getting people to give more and getting people to give more effectively, are kind of best taken together. Um, so I'll just kind of explain this now uh, with a little chart that I stole from uh, Toby Ord. Um, this is the only, I'm not going to bore everyone with charts and graphs, this is the only one I'm going to, to use. Um, so this graph uh, plots the amount of money given uh, against the cost effectiveness of the place that it's given to. So if you're talking in terms of individual donations, um, then the cost effectiveness thing is basically which charity you're donating to. Um, so the, the orange square kind of represents the total amount of good that you do, uh, or if that's a bit vague, uh, maybe something like the total impact or something like that. Um, so it seems obvious that uh, by increasing the amount that you give, you can increase the amount of good that you can do, like that. Um, and that's something that probably everyone's really aware of. But something I think that sometimes passes people by, um, but I think is really important, is that you can actually increase the total impact by choosing to donate to more effective charities like so. And that's something that Giving What We Can uh, really sort of holds dear. That's one of the main tenets of what we do. We really think that giving cost effectively uh, can be 
several times more important, uh, can be, well, several times, uh, can do several times as much good, if you like, uh, than giving less cost effectively. So, I'd just like to sort of finish up my introduction by um, saying a little bit about what Giving What We Can Birmingham actually wants to do. Um, so, as I say, this, this event represents the chapter launch uh, with, with the 10th chapter that Giving What We Can has. So, what we'd like to do is kind of create a local community where there'll be speakers, uh, there'll be events like this happening all the time where people can discuss um, you know, ethics or development or cost effectiveness or whatever related to Giving What We Can and the um, As I say, we're not going to sort of browbeat people into signing the pledge today. Um, but we really would like to, uh, to, to be able to recruit new members in the future. That's always something that we do have on our kind of radar. Um, we're giving what we can, um, also joining giving what we can and being part of it. Um, there's something in it for other people as well. Uh, it's not just about being completely altruistic. Um, at the end of the day, it's uh, a really fun thing to do. It's a good feeling and it's a really good uh, way to meet very nice people. And so the subject of nice people is a neat segue into uh, introducing the speakers today. Um, we've got three absolutely brilliant speakers, one of whom will be here in Skype spirit. Um, so I'll just move straight on to that uh, and introduce the first speaker. So I've got to say, uh, our first speaker's appearance uh, is sponsored by the Centre for the Study of Global Ethics and the Department uh, for Political Science uh, and International Studies here at the University of Birmingham. Uh, he's one of the leading thinkers on equality. Uh, so I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Professor Larry Temkin. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, this is actually a horrible room to give a talk in. Uh, because I'm the sort of person who actually likes to make eye contact with people, but if I make con contact with you guys over here, these guys are just looking at the back of my head, and then I'll turn over here, and then you're looking at the back of my head, and that really sucks for everybody. So uh, there's no lectern, because I actually have a proper talk of a sort to give. Um, Simon has been enormously, uh, I don't know, you guys have no idea how hard he's been working on this. Maybe it's just because he's been working with me. But I sent him about 5,000 emails, and he sent me about 5,001 back. And uh, thanks so much for everything you've done to make this happen. And thank you all for showing up today at this very important event. Um, I had the distinct privilege of helping to launch the Princeton chapter of Giving What We Can um, in 2011, along with Jeffrey Sachs. Some of you know him or know his work, director of the Earth Institute. And, former director of the UN Millennium Project from 2002 to 2006. But I must say it's a special honor to be helping to launch the Birmingham chapter of Giving What We Can, and especially to be doing so with my good friend, uh, Peter Singer. As many of you know, Peter's article, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, served as the wake-up call and clarion call for many people entire generations of philosophers to take seriously the issue of obligations to the needy, both as a matter of deep personal moral concern and as an important theoretical and philosophical topic. As no exaggeration to say that Peter's influence, sustained attention to the topic, has done more to highlight our obligations to the needy than the work of any other philosopher, living or dead. As you will soon hear, I depart from Peter regarding the ultimate grounding and extent of our obligations to the needy. But the differences between us pale in their significance relative to the many points of practical agreement. Part one, introduction. In the only sentence of his powerful book, Living High and Letting Die, Peter Unger notes that, I quote, each year millions of children die from easy to beat disease, from malnutrition, and from bad drinking water. Indeed, as he goes on to note, in each of the past 30 years, well over 10 million children died from readily preventable causes." End quote. So our question is as simple as it is poignant. What, if anything, should our reaction be to the fact that each one of us could easily prevent the deaths of many innocent children? Now, this is a topic that's all too easy to ignore even as our actions or inactions literally and indisputably make the difference for whether innocent children live or die. It's a topic that cries out for careful, detailed, and rigorous arguments that can't possibly be presented in the time I have allotted. So this talk is doomed to be superficial and unsatisfying. 
still like to present some relevant considerations that may help provide a framework for thinking about this crucially important topic, even if they do not settle. Part two, possible responses. Putting the question as I did above, it may seem there's an obvious response as to what we should do, but in fact, the question provokes a wide range of responses. At one end of the spectrum are those like Garrett Hardin, who argue that we should do nothing to prevent the deaths of distant, of distant children. Indeed, that it's actually bad to aid such children, not because he's a horrible person, but because he believes that for each child we save today, five will die tomorrow. Others claim that we may help unfortunate children if we like, but we may also permissibly ignore their plight. There are at least three different bases for this position. The first is a deep skepticism about morality itself. In this view, there is no right or wrong. Hence, nothing we do is wrong. And so failing to help the world's needy cannot be wrong. I don't think there's a view out there that could be more wrong. <laughs> the second is a kind of contractual or social convention view of morality. On this view, right or wrong simply reflect the agreements of rational self-interested agents. Thus, I act wrongly only if I violate my freely chosen moral agreements. And if I don't want to join an agreement requiring me to help the world's children, that's up to me. A third view is a libertarian position. On this view, people are free to act however they want, so long as they don't violate anybody else's rights against non-aggression. On this view, people have a right not to be attacked. And I act wrongly or unjustly if I violate that right. But they have no right against me to be aided. And hence, I do not act wrongly or unjustly if I fail to aid the needy. At the other end of the spectrum, some think that we must do everything we possibly can to help the needy. In principle, this may involve giving away all of our wealth and belongings until we're no better off than those that we seek to aid. On this view, we must be prepared to sacrifice all of our personal interests, including those of our family, for the sake of aiding as many as possible. Moreover, not only must we sacrifice our own interests, we should do whatever is necessary to prevent avoidable deaths, even if this requires sacrificing the interests of others. Indeed, even if it requires stealing from, harming, or possibly even killing some for the sake of saving more, numerous others. Utilitarians have long been associated with such positions. But other powerful arguments supporting some of these views, only some, have been famously advanced by Peter Singer, and more recently by Peter Hunter. As is often the case in morality and life, the truth about this issue is complicated and difficult to discern. But it almost certainly lies between the extremes noted above. Surely we do not have to do everything possible to save as many as possible but neither can we simply ignore the world's children. We must, I am confident, do much more than most of us do to alleviate hunger and illness. Part three, a framework. So far, I've only offered assertions. Let me next offer a framework for thinking about our topic. I spent 15 years working on a book on equality. Because of this, people expect me to defend my views about the needy in terms of equality. But that is a mistake. There's a strong tendency for people to think about whatever ideal they value most, and then to address every moral issue in terms of that ideal. So, for example, utilitarians, libertarians, and egalitarians address issues in terms of what would be best with respect to utility, freedom, or liberty, sorry, freedom or equality, respectively. Such narrow, single-minded focus is deeply mistaken. The truth about morality is complex, and there isn't just one thing about morality that matters. There are many relevant factors 
regarding most moral issues. And what we need as people who are concerned about fundamental moral issues are not simple pat answers, but careful, thoughtful consideration of all of the relevant factors. We need to be pluralists about moral values, that is, to think about issues pluralistically. So let me suggest one pluralistic model for thinking about today's topic. It's not the only one, but it's one. Historically, many philosophers have focused on three different approaches as morally fundamental. The first addresses the question, how ought the world to be? The focus here is on the value of outcomes and what happens. The second addresses the question, what kind of person ought I to be? The focus here is on the character of moral agents. The third addresses the question, what ought I to do? The focus here is on the moral assessment of particular actions, and in particular on the notion of agent relative duties or obligations. These three approaches correspond respectively to what philosophers call consequentialist, virtue, and deontological approaches. Many argue issues in terms of just one of these approaches, but as I've suggested, this is a mistake. The human enterprise of trying to figure out how to live properly and in harmony with ourselves and others and the larger world requires that we take a broad perspective. The fully moral life, the fully human life, requires that we pay attention to each of these concerns, to what happens, whether as a result of what we do or fail to do, to the kind of person we are, whether virtuous or vicious, and to our duties and obligations to ourselves and others. So I submit that we need to address today's topic from all three perspectives. And when one does that, it becomes clear, I believe, that there's substantial moral reason to be concerned about the world's meaning. For example, if you ask which outcome is better, <laughs> one in which many innocent children die painfully of easily avoidable hunger and disease, or one in which affluent Westerners have fewer toys and sweaters, eat out less, or have fewer kitchen appliances, it seems clear that on any plausible theory of the good, and I've read a lot of them, I've even written a few, <laughs> the latter outcome would be better than the former. Likewise, there's little doubt that among the most central and important virtues are the virtues of beneficence, sympathy, compassion, and generosity. But then if one takes seriously the notion that the kind of person I ought to be or the kind of life I ought to lead is a virtuous one, surely at some point one must give priority to the easily preventable hunger and illness of innocent children over further acquisitions of goods that one doesn't need, will hardly use, and wouldn't miss if you didn't care. For the truly virtuous person, ignoring the world's children is not an option. Finally, we turn to the trickiest question, category, the question of duty. Some people, like Jan Narvison, I believe that it would be nice of us to benefit the needy, but that this lies within the domain of charity and is merely a matter of the heart. On his view, our duties consist in respecting rights, and while people have a strong negative right not to be interfered with, they do not have a positive right to be aided. And as such, we do not violate anyone's rights or act unjustly if we fail to aid the needy. Now many would dispute Darwin's claims and insist that people do have a right to positive aid, a positive right to aid. But even if one grants Narvison's claim that the needy don't have a right against me for aid and that I don't act unjustly 
if I ignore their plight. It's clear that our duties and obligations extend significantly beyond merely respecting people's rights. And that people can and often do act deeply wrongly, even if they don't act unjustly in Narvison's terms. Positive duties are still duties, and one acts wrongly if one fails to fulfill them. Moreover, failing to fulfill a positive duty can be worse, that is, more significantly open to moral criticism than failing to fulfill a negative duty, even if the latter involves a violation of rights and hence an injustice, or the former does not. To see this, consider first a variation of one of Singer's classic examples. You should all be familiar with. Suppose John is one of 20 people walking by a pond in which a young child is drowning. If John can save the child, he has a duty to do so, even though the child has no special right against John or any of the others that he is saved. To be sure, if one of the others jumps in and saves the child, John is relieved of the responsibility of doing so. But if no one else jumps in, John must. So when John lets the child drown to preserve his suit, he acts wrongly, even though he has lots of company in that regard, and even though I'm assuming for the sake of argument that he would not be violating the child's rights, and hence would not be acting unjustly if he failed to help. On the other hand, suppose Tom and Tim have been given a box of candy to share. Tom takes one extra piece. Since this piece belongs to Tim, Tom is, in essence, stealing. He is taking what doesn't belong to him, and in so doing, he violates Tim's right and acts unjustly. Still, while Tom has violated a negative duty, and John has merely violated a positive duty, John's failure to save a drowning child is morally much worse than, and hence is open to much more serious moral criticism, than Tom sealing a piece of Tim's candy. And this raises another important point. It's often assumed that positive duties are like giving to charity, where it's optional as to where, when, how, and perhaps even whether one chooses to fulfill this duty. But this is a grave mistake. It conflates the category of positive duties, acts that we have a duty to perform, perhaps on behalf of others, with the category of supererogation, acts that are above and beyond the call of duty. It is true that there are often various ways that one might acceptably discharge one's positive duties. But one cannot simply ignore them without acting wrongly nor can one fulfill them in any way one chooses. Suppose to modify another famous example, I see three runaway trolleys hurtling down the tracks. If I do nothing, the first trolley will plow into five people, killing them all. The second will hit one person, severing his foot. And the third will destroy an expensive car. Assuming that with little effort, I could stop one, but only one of the trolleys. And that I have no personal connections with anyone involved. It seems clear that I ought morally to stop the first trolley. Indeed, even assuming that no one has a right against me, that I act at all, and hence that I cannot be accused of acting unjustly if I do nothing, it still seems clear that I act wrongly if I sit by and do nothing. Likewise, it seems clear that I would also act wrongly if I chose to save the car, and even that I would act wrongly if I chose to save the person's foot. Like negative duties, some positive duties are more pressing, urgent, and it's not up to me to simply choose to do anything at all, much less nothing at all, at least it's not up to me 
if I don't want to be open to serious moral criticism. The preceding considerations suggest that we do have duties and obligations to help others, and that we cannot simply choose whether and how to fulfill them. Almost certainly, if we want to act rightly, we must address the most pressing needs before addressing other needs. Almost certainly, this means that to fulfill our positive duties to aid others, we must address the easily preventable deaths of innocent children. Before we make our contributions to fostering literacy, promoting the environment, or, dare I say it, higher education. Does this mean that we can't give to other valuable causes that matter to us? No. But we must do so as voluntary acts that are, in fact, above and beyond the call of duty. This requires that we may permissibly give to such causes only after first fulfilling our positive duty to respond to the most urgent needs of others. How much must we actually do regarding the latter before we can legitimately do the former? I'm not sure. But I think the old adage of giving till it hurts might be a useful place to start. Consistent with our meeting our other duties and obligations to our children, our students, our loved ones, etc., perhaps we must give to prevent starvation and illness at least up to the point where further giving would genuinely worsen our lives significantly. At that point, if we choose to give even further, perhaps, but only perhaps, we then have the option of giving to any other cause. <coughs> In sum, taking a pluralistic approach to morality, it seems clear that most of us should do more to benefit the world's children. We should do this for consequentialist reasons, to make the world a better place. For virtuous reasons, because that's the kind of person one should want to be, and the kind of life one should want to lead. And for deontological reasons, because aiding the needy is not simply an option. It's a duty that can be every bit as urgent and strict as our duties to respect rights and act justly. Part four, we can do better. Many Westerners like to think of themselves as generous to those less fortunate. Whether or not that's so, it's interesting to look at how Brits and Americans spend their money to see whether they could do more to help the world's badly off. Of course, we all know they could, but let's go on anyway. Virtually all of the following data is taken from sources like the BBC, or the UK Office for National Statistics, with the latest available data, which I'll draw on, sometimes for 2009, sometimes for 2010, and sometimes for 2011. There were different databases available to me online, and so I took whatever I could the most recent. It is true that in 2010, Brits gave a total of 8.16 billion pounds to international development or humanitarian assistance, either as individuals or through private organizations. And that sure seems like a big number, doesn't it? 8.16 billion pounds? So let me note that that represents just over one half of 1% of the UK's gross national income and just under 1% of total annual household expenditures. Here are a few other figures for comparison. In 2009, individual Brits spent 31 billion pounds on alcohol and tobacco products. That number will probably surprise you. It seems a little low to me, doesn't it? <laughs> and another 10 to 20 billion on illegal drugs. That also seems a bit low to me, I must say. Maybe it's the circles I run in. <laughs> 49, I have a few friends who seem to store it that much in a week. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. No, that's true. I don't know anybody who stores it. But if I did, I'm sure. I'd. Never mind. 49 billion pounds on tourism. 89 billion pounds on restaurants and hotels. 99 billion pounds on recreation and culture. In addition, in 2011, they spent 42 billion pounds on gambling. 
This means that individual Brits would have to contribute as much as they spent in 2010 on international relief for approximately 40 years before they would have spent as much as they spent annually on tobacco, alcohol, drugs, traveling, recreation, and eating out. May I add the following obvious point? If Brits cut their consumption of restaurant food, tobacco, alcohol, drugs, and gambling by 25%, just 25%, and spent that money on international aid, this would increase the relief funds from roughly 8 billion pounds to over 40 billion pounds. Moreover, this would not only be much better for the starving masses of the world, it would be much better for the people in the UK in purely self-interested terms, is that they would then be living better, healthier lifestyles. It's a win-win. So the very same action could not only save lives overseas, it could save lives right here in the UK. Now the preceding numbers may all seem too abstract to mean very much. So let me add a few trivial but revealing slightly more personal observations. Let's go to the other side of the pond. Consider the following list of different products that Americans might have in their home, each of which serves the function of warming food or drink. Conventional oven, convection oven, crock pot, stove, wok, microwave, toaster oven, toaster, which is distinct from toaster oven, toaster is not good for bagels, it turns out, <laughs> pizza maker, fry baby, Coffee maker, roaster, espresso machine, gotta have your espresso machine, popcorn maker, grill, bun warmer, rotisserie, bagel toaster,